This was by far uh, worse than uh, the last episode that we did. This was not as much fun to watch these ones. <laughs> Welcome to Twin Films. Welcome to another episode of Twin Film Encounter. This is a show where I sit down with a friend and we watch two twin films to see which one did the premise better. Uh, these ones both had Gabriel Byrne and that was the only thing saving them. These were not as much fun as Armageddon or Deep Impact because there weren't as many explosions, I guess. <laughs> and weirdly, those two movies made more logical sense than these did. Did we say what movies we're watching? Oh no, we didn't. End Ugh, of Days motherfucker. and Stigmata. It's been a long week, guys. End of Days is about how, how Satan possesses Gabriel Byrne, who has to impregnate the girl from the movie The Craft so that she can give birth to the Antichrist on the dawn of the new millennium. Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a grumpy, sad security guard who makes pizza smoothies along with his sidekick, Kevin Pollock, who you may know is the guy who does the Christopher Walken impressions. And they are the only ones standing in Satan's way. So now let's read what I wrote for a synopsis of End of Days. A product of its era that takes itself too seriously and is weighed down by its own inconsistent logic, disorienting editing, and dingy dark set design and lighting. The only time I could tell what was happening was the last set piece on the train. <laughs> <laughs> Both of these movies have Gabriel Byrne. For some reason, we looked up the months that they came out. Two months apart, they both one came, month apart. One was September 1999, and one was November 1999. So it's unclear how this was not a contractual conflict of interest. <laughs> well, in End of Days, Gabriel Byrne plays Satan, or a man possessed by Satan. And then in Stigmata, he plays literally the polar opposite of that as a priest detective scientist Science, yeah, he's a detective science priest <laughs> doctor detective science priest i am also a scientist and i observe the facts there's a couple of I I interesting things that happen in the first like 10 or 15 minutes there's a lot going on but also we have no idea what's going on for right. like 45 minutes <laughs> yeah exactly it starts with a priest in the vatican the vatican looking at the moon and there's a comet and we learn that this is the uh, the god uh, called the god's eye because he pulls out a book and there's an illustration right. and then there's exposition and then we cut to new york where that same night or i guess previously because there's a seven hour time difference so there's some sort of prophecy <laughs> let's just hold on you're getting we're getting in the weeds here there's some sort of prophecy where the main protagonist i guess the, i don't know if she's the protagonist but she is this woman is born whenever 20 years before Y2K. Right. And it is prophesied that in when she's like 18 or 20 years old, Satan will try to impregnate her to create the Antichrist. Yes. And there are priests in the Vatican who want to kill her, but they decide not to. And then Udo Kier is the one who, who is the OBGYN who births her. Yeah, and he's got a, he cuts open a snake and feeds her snake blood. Right, there's a lot of Satanists in the mix. I think the idea is that there's a lot of Satanists hidden in plain view. Yeah, but I'm confused because I was under the impression that Udo Kier and all the people that fed the child, the baby snake blood, I thought they were on the side of the priests in the Vatican. But you learn later that Udo is not because she's he's helping the, the, the stepmom who looks like a lawn gnome. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, and we don't learn too much more about Udo Kier because um, uh, Gabriel Byrne, once he's possessed by Satan, punches straight through his head like that the me, have you seen the meme? There's the just straight, just punch straight through his head meme. No. It's like, a, it's it's on the screen right now because I think it's one of the funniest fucking memes I've ever seen. And they do it in the movie and it's like out of nowhere. It's very, very abrupt. Also, just, we gotta give a shout out to Udo Kier. This is the second time he's shown up in a movie. In, as a doctor. As a doctor <laughs> in a, t the tiniest part. He's in two scenes, maybe. 
Yeah, so Udo Kier has become the unofficial mascot of this show now. <laughs> How did they get a ritual rattlesnake into a hospital? I just didn't understand. <sighs> All right. <okay. laughs> There's gonna be a lot of points where I just give up on a thought that I had because it literally is so dumb, it doesn't matter. I neither of these, like you were saying, Harland, the, the logic in neither of these movies is up to snuff. No, it's it's really lazy kind of screenwriting and storytelling that, that leaves you going, what, why, how? A at every scene, almost. We are introduced to Gabriel Byrne, who uh, we learn after the fact, it was also prophesied that he would be possessed by the devil. Uh, but why? At, at the, we don't know, we never learn why. I think he's, he was born on a certain time. I think that's all we learn. Really? I, I, it's, it's a throwaway line. That somebody is like, oh, the same reason Christine was was picked, Gabriel was picked up for the same reason of like the time of his birth. Well, hang on, I have a, oh, wait. So it, she's like 20 years old. He's like 70. <laughs> no, he's like 45. <laughs> yeah. So is there a different prophecy for the Satan possession? Must, must could be. They just forgot to film that part. <laughs> <laughs> Left on the editing room floor. So things that don't make sense, we have, Satan popping out of the New York sewers like the like the predator in, in yeah. stealth mode. Which I thought that looked cool. I was cool. like, just do that. Well, and Stan Winston, who's pretty, I don't know all his credits, but he's a renowned effects guy. He did the effects, so you see him in the credits and you think, oh, this is gonna be cool. I think he did the, all the stuff on the thing. Like he's oh, he's yeah. he's like the special <laughs> effects guy you go to. Wait, things that don't make sense. Gabriel Byrne is in a restaurant with a man and oh a woman God. who we never meet. We don't know who they are. Gabriel Byrne goes to the bathroom, is immediately possessed by Predator Satan. Mm -hmm. and then Which he that scene was actually kind of effective. I thought that was yeah. a cool, in terms of it being like a horror, like setting up yeah. the vibe of the movie, it, it was kind of intense and like it was very much like, yeah, like a horror movie. just makes out with the woman, fully, full boob grab, boob out in the restaurant, leaves the restaurant, restaurant explodes. And I do want to say too, talking about Gabriel Byrne, like I know, I know his face, but I don't think I knew his name. He's been in a ton of stuff. He has a, a, a certain amount of gravitas about him. Um, it's just unfortunate that he was in these two really bad movies, but he he does exude like oh that's fucking Satan like he's cool yeah he does a great job and it's also interesting to see him playing two opposite yeah. characters back to back because he does them both really effectively he is the best part of these movies and, and I mean some of the cooler scenes in End of Days are just Gabriel Byrne walking around chewing New York, the scenery knew it wearing a big dark coat looking scary yeah and he's he's creepy it's also kind of understated compared to the rest of the movie that's psychotic <laughs> you mean Arnold <laughs> yeah Arnold is going through some shit in this movie that needs to be addressed in therapy <laughs> yeah he does he makes a smoothie out, well he he's about to kill himself but then Kevin Pollock interrupts. Kevin Pollock's character's name, and I am not making this up, is Bobby Chicago. <laughs> Arnold's name is Jericho Kane. So it's Jericho and Chicago are partners. There is a lot of ham-fisted biblical references. The main, uh, uh, Laura, is it Laura Tooney? Something Tooney is the actress's name that plays Christine. Oh yeah, I don't know, I, yeah, I don't remember. I looked up what it was and I did a little analysis. The story of the city of Jericho is often associated with the idea of a great battle or the overcoming of insurmountable obstacles through faith, which parallels Schwarzenegger's character's struggle against demonic forces. A little on the nose. <laughs> Cain, as in Cable and Abe, is the biblical story where Cain was the first person to murder somebody. Uh, and it's probably a darker interpretation that could hint at the flawed and troubled nature of Schwarzenegger's character. Which they do, um, I guess, effectively in depicting without exposition, like dialogue exposition. We, we cut to him and his dark 
apartment with the shades drawn. It's messy, it's filthy, and he's trying to cry while he puts a gun in his mouth. <laughs> And then Kevin interrupts him. And so he makes a smoothie made of a piece of pizza he gets off the floor. Old Chinese food. Old Chinese food. Is there beer in it? Uh, yeah, I have a list of all the stuff he put in there as he was doing it. Pepto-Bismol, leftover beer, a banana, Chinese food, and pizza from the floor. And he blends it up. Do we see him actually drink it? Yeah, oh, okay. dude, we oh, do. Oh God. Arnold is no longer a police officer because his family was murdered in a absolutely ludicrous manner. Just gang style execution by some mafia people who I guess he testified against, but it doesn't matter. Well, and we also don't learn really the, the full story unless I wasn't paying attention. No, until like the end. Yeah, until the fucking, the last act. But, so he's now working as a security guard and that, his security guard mission that he does that day sort of sets in motion his involvement in the plot. But I wanna know, this is the most sophisticated security executive protection outfit I have ever seen. They've got a full, it's like a NASA style war room with satellites and a big, the big monitor, the, the monitor that, you know, the spy monitor. Well, and also at the end, they, they do like the gearing up scene where it's like close up shots of him putting like the gun on his ankle yeah. and the gun down his wrist and the bandol, like they do all that. And I'm looking at some of the weaponry and this is supposed to be New York City in 1999. I mean, this was, I guess, post 9-11. No, it's pre, it's 1999. Or pre 9-11, that's yeah. what I meant, sorry. It's pre 9-11. So I guess maybe gun laws are a little less strict, but the ordinance that they have, he pulls out slugs that look like explosive tipped rockets. And this is to, <laughs> and, and this is to protect, so they're supposed to protect Gabriel Byrne, who is a businessman. Right. It's like, He's not that important. Which I also have questions about. Was he a businessman before he was possessed? I think I think that's the assumption. And so he's still what going, going to, to his work day job as the devil? What? <laughs> you gotta pay them bills. Also, this leads into the problem with like the rules. I think we mentioned in the last episode that rules in a movie are very important. They're even more important when you're doing like a horror movie or like anything that has to do with supernatural stuff because you're, you're dealing with bending physics in a lot of ways. So shut up. What are the rules here? Why one, if he is Satan, because we see Gabriel Byrne get shot a bunch, eventually turns into like a goopy mummified skeleton guy at the end. He falls out a window. He falls out a window, oh. but in some cases he heals immediately. In other cases, he literally disintegrates after he gets hit by a train. So which is it? Can he heal or does he fall apart? Was that a timeline thing? Yeah. Also, if he can heal, why the fuck does he need to hire these ex-military cop bodyguard people to protect him? Protect him from well, what? I th yeah, you know, I didn't even think, cause, it, cause if he just turned into Satan yesterday, he's not gonna have enough time to hire these security goons with this whole thing. They make it seem like the security outfit was already scheduled Maybe he's a crooked business guy already. I, I have unclear. I have no, it's, yeah. it's, there's so many things that happen in such quick succession in the first act. I think they do it on purpose. So you yeah, don't, don't worry don't about, yeah. about it. Don't think about it. it. There's the devil and then there's this woman and shut, shut up, don't ask. And then a sniper priest oh, tries yeah. to shoot at them. And then it, in, there's a helicopter chase that ensues in downtown Manhattan, <laughs> which is pretty cool. The funniest, uh, yeah, I mean, it's always cool. Nowadays in the year 2024, when you see a movie and it's clearly all CGI and it looks fucking terrible, it is still cool to go back and watch these older movies when they're doing practical shit. I mean, we I talked about it in Deep Impact where they have the helicopter on the sea, on the, like, oh, that's a real, like, that shit's there. This helicopter was really there. There was really a guy hanging out of it, but it is, it gets a little goofy when he gets stuck on the rappelling line. And he's and supermanning. He's, he's just sort of floating there awkwardly chasing this guy down on a rooftop. I laughed out loud yeah. multiple times in this movie because of some of the weird, funny stunts. Unfortunately, that's kind of all there is for the practical effects in the movie. They don't really, everything else is a lot of, I mean, the train kind of, but it's. We can talk a little bit about some of the effects. That train scene at the end used really good miniatures. Mm -hmm. That whole scene where it like crumples in on itself 
like a tin can and it explodes. That's all miniatures. I mean, it's obviously miniatures, but they're really good. There's really bad miniatures and that whole set piece was like really cool. Them in the train, falling over, all that stuff looked really, really well, except for when <laughs> he jumps from one train car and gets shot. And again, this is where the physics things, what are the rules? Because he gets shot and it throws him like 50 feet backwards through the other train car that he just jumped out of. One thing that I really, when we're watching these with a critical eye, which I wouldn't normally do if I was just watching this at home, <laughs> but I'm just very aware of the time, the time period, right? It's like in the production and the sort of zeitgeist that we're operating in. So it's like, yeah. it opens with this very hackneyed cliche, like religious iconography, there's like, scrolls in the background and like so in God we scrolls. trust kind of stuff and it's very sort of like this is a movie about God and Satan and and stuff and then every scene it's like okay now we're in a hospital set now we're in an apartment set now we're on the train station set there's it's all with a couple exceptions it's very much like we are in set pieces yeah. now and it just feels very dated. I noticed in watching these, I was like, man, a lot of this feels like uh, the, the production design of a movie like Seven, mm -hmm. which came out in 1995. It did this genre the best. And from that point on, there's a lot of movies that came out in the following five to 10 years. Both of these movies are examples of this that looked like they were trying to replicate or emulate David Fincher's sort of design philosophy and his aesthetic. Because back to Arnold's character introduction, we're in a dingy, disgusting apartment. Uh, there's food, he's eating <laughs> banana Chinese food smoothies. And, and then also when we go to like, there's a scene where we, he chases down the rooftop sniper priest into his little lair that's either under the church or under the subway. I don't, I can't tell. But but when we go into there, it, yeah. it's very reminiscent of like some of the scenes that you'd see in, in Seven where there's like jars of weird stuff. There's a fridge that's got like uh, something nasty in it. There's, tongue, isn't there a tongue? Oh, oh yeah, he cuts out tongue. his own tongue. And then there's like, you know, religious iconography. There's oh. crosses and crucifixes everywhere. There's no lights, but they don't, do it right. They just don't, it's not executed it's, the same. It's dumb instead of creepy and scary. Yes. Yeah. And that also leads into kind of the technical aspects of how this movie is shot. If you're gonna do this sort of thriller, whether it's supernatural or not, sort of this, this dark decaying world, right? You need to lock your fucking camera down to let the audience be able to kind of take that world in. As opposed to end of days, every time there's any sort of action, it's like we're on a roller coaster and I'm gonna throw up. It's terrible. It feels really claustrophobic. And David Fincher's movie is like seven. I'm gonna keep using this example. It, it feels claustrophobic, but you're able to understand why it feels claustrophobic. In addition to all that, specifically about the Fincher echo. The Fincher effect. The, the Fincher <laughs> echo. The, I think a big prop, the, I think one of the biggest problems with this movie is Arnold Schwarzenegger. He yeah. doesn't work. Like he does what he does great. And we all love Arnold for what he does, but there's a lot of like serious actors in this movie. You know, you have Gabriel Byrne, you have, I think her name is CCH Pounder, who's yes. the cop, who's a good actor. Even Christine York, the young woman, she's, yeah. she does fine. Um, Kevin Pollock is, he's an actor. Yeah. They have talented actors and Arnold can't, can't hang or lend any sort of gravitas to what seems like it wants to be not just an Arnold action movie. It right. feels like they're trying to make it be a little bit more weighty or serious given you know the themes and sort of the production style. But Arnold just can't hack it. He doesn't have the chops and yeah, he can't meet the other actors on that same level. I mean, there are multiple scenes where he has to cry and he just can't. It looks like a guy acting like he's crying. And we get a lot of the Arnold Schwarzenegger total recall shocked, yeah, yeah. shocked faces. <laughs> <laughs> In the sort of climax of the whole situation, uh, Arnold gets possessed by the devil, right. and so and and the devil is trying to uh, force him to 
I guess impregnate. Impregnate Christine York. But he's like fighting with himself and it's just. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. The one thing that Arnold can do is in that scene where he's trying to convince her like, no, everything's okay or whatever. And then, and there's a turn. There is a moment where I was like, oh, he can do that. He can do kind of like the sinister smirking oh, yeah. sort of guy. I was like, I believe him there. But then when he's there, yeah, it switches and he like comes out of his trance sort of. And he's tr supposed to be, again, a little bit more mournful or emotional about like ha having a struggle. It just doesn't, it, 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 he falls on his face. And then he falls on a fucking sword. <laughs> and an another thing that's about the time period is this is, you know, right on the heels of the satanic panic of the right. 80s and, and early 90s, which uh, it was a major societal thing where people thought that groups of secret, secret groups of Satanists were abusing and kidnapping and ch kidnapping children, sacrificing babies. Or turning you gay. Turning was... people gay. Uh, it was a real problem that was the result of basically bogus accounts in the 80s. and Nancy Reagan. Around that time period, yeah. yeah. And so there's like huge satanic gatherings in underground dive bars in this movie. And it's like, where are all of these satanists coming from? You also have, this is very much a product of the Y2K, hullabaloo, I mean, you have the shock jock on the radio who's like, we're gonna have the greatest party of all time. WBAZ time is 8.06. Three more nights, New York. Three more nights left in the century. Three more nights left in the millennium. Three more nights until every computer fails. And oh, and, and another thing is there's a lot of like new metal in the soundtrack. There's this- Which I, I went over my head because I think <laughs> I think I was just so distracted by like what was happening in the movie. <laughs> you mentioned that there's a Limp Biscuit song? Yeah. Totally didn't there, hear that. There's this very bizarre scene where it's unclear if it's real or a hallucination, oh, but yeah. David, or not David Byrne, not no, Peter, I, not Peter Gabriel. I kept saying the same thing. <laughs> Gabriel Byrne. Peter, Gabriel Byrne looks at this mother and daughter and then there's a hard cut to him having this threesome with both of them and Limp Biscuit is playing in the background. I think I, I was just so shocked to, because <laughs> again, who are those people? Who, who, he, he shows up at somebody's house. Was this a planned dinner date that the previous Gabriel Byrne was? I, I don't even remember where, are they not just people he walks by on the street? Oh, we'll, we'll get into this more with Stigmata, but both of these movies leave you at the end with sort of a big question of, why? There's this church in New York City where somehow Arnold takes refuge. I don't even know how this church shows up. And they have like a hidden basement that he stumbles upon where they're doing like... There's a woman that is suffering from stigmata. Yeah. And they're doing like research about the prophecy and they have computers and it's... But, but why? And this is just a random diocese in New York City. And this is also a thing, I mean, it's, it's touched on very briefly in End of Days, but it's like a major sort of plot point or character development thing in Stigmata where like they're, ta they're kind of touching on the like science versus religion thing, mm -hmm. you know, and how do you measure these things and all that stuff. And they just don't execute it in the best way. I, and I don't know if there is a really good way to, to stick that landing, you, you know what I mean? Unless, again, you really set up what the fuck the rules are. Well, and this was something we were talking about uh, before we were rolling in our prep. We, we prep, we do our homework for this. Uh, you were saying that- I looked at IMDb <laughs> trivia. Well, and you also looked at global time zones. Mm. There's very specific rules that the Antichrist has to impregnate Christine York right. between 11 p.m. and midnight on New Year's Eve in New York City of 1999. And there are very specific reasons right. why that doesn't make sense. So the problem is, is that if it's 11 p.m. to midnight in New York City, that would make it 6 and 7 a.m. January 1st, the following day in Rome, where I assume this prophecy was discovered, written, 
fucking made up. And also New York City didn't exist and nobody believed, nobody was aware of, of the continent of North America when this yeah. all happened. Or that the earth was round yeah. or that the earth even revolved around the sun. So how do they calculate this stuff? And, and also there's like a throwaway line about like, well, why is it 1999? Well, because like people associate 666 with the number of the beast, but actually if you look at it upside down, it's 1999. Oh my God. I I was like, I was whoa, so whoa, mad. Whoa, 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 hang on, whoa. So wait, hang on. 666? The number of the beast is not 666. Often in dreams, numbers appear upside down and backward. So 666 becomes 999, like in 1999, the year of his return. What does that have to do with me? Also another thing that sort of bugged me about, it didn't sort of bug me, it bugged me about this movie was that, um, Christine York, who is the 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 vessel. potential the vessel, the vessel the vessel, she has been raised by Satanists yeah. in sort of like a Rosemary's Baby kind of cabalish situation. But we're never how? we don't ever understand how or why. I mean, there is like the weird it's... machinations when she's born in the beginning, but and we it's don't... the same nurse yeah. who ends up being her like adoptive mother. And Udo Kier is somehow involved, uh, which is weird because the Vatican is aware of her the entire right. Well, they time. say at the very beginning, and I made a note that said, uh, send out emissaries to all cities in the world? How big is the fucking Vatican? How many, wh all cities? Not major cities. So w w fucking Joplin, like, and how, and how are the Satanists ahead of the, uh, how, if the Vatican has that much power, but the Satanists are there in the fucking delivery room? Well, it's because everything happens in New York City. <laughs> and they're, they it's, have... it's, it's the urban jungle. It's full of devil worshippers. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the Satanists, uh, you know, because they can't, they can't spread themselves that thin. They go for the major cities, the, the most populated ones, because the chances are much higher but than if you to her parents? go to Parsons, Kansas. <laughs> Paris, Texas. Yeah, just some guy rolls up on a bus like, all right, I guess I wait for 20 years to see if maybe. <laughs> we have to talk about the editing in this goddamn, both of these goddamn movies. And I think maybe there's a good segue yeah. into Stigmata because I, I thought that this type of editing was like an early late 2000s thing when like the Jason Bourne movies came out because it's like everybody makes fun of the Jason Bourne movies for the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> quick cuts they like cross the 180 degree line that you don't it's really disorienting I thought it kind of started there nope it's been going on for decades before that <clears throat> because every action scene is like they can't let the camera sit for more than six frames at a time in some instances. There are dozens of cuts within a matter of seconds and both of us were texting each other when we were watching these being like, what is happening? Like yeah. I told you, I, it felt like I was gonna throw up. I had to like look away from the camera in multiple scenes. Yeah, it's, it's, it makes you feel dizzy. It's the, it's, and it's not just the cutting, it's these it, I think you said it was probably a digital shake. It looks like a digital post-production after yeah. effect shake that they did. I think the two scenes that I remember it being worst on were the train scene and then the, the scene in the, before you see the the devil the final with showdown. the pews. The, yeah. That pews effect was really cool. There were some really cool effects. The the guy on the train that like shatters into a million pieces, yeah. that didn't look terrible. He looks like one of the members of the band, The Prodigy. There's really good explosions. Uh, I'm a fan. I mean, it's the fucking 90s. Explosions were real back then. Because when the when the devil devil predator uh, cloak mode comes out of the sewers, there's like fire coming out of the manhole covers, and it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. That didn't look like a backlog. That no. looked like real streets. Yeah. Probably not in New York. Probably, I mean, it's probably Atlanta Va or Canada. Vancouver. Yeah, it's one of the two. That's where the movies get made. Because in Stigmata, they're clearly on a back lot for the, the street scenes. And I don't know what it is about how you're able to tell like, oh, that's a fucking back lot. That's not a real street. I don't know if it's like the streets are too narrow 
or or what, but immediately you can always tell when someone's on a backlog. And by contrast, there's actually one really cool scene at the beginning of Stigmata when Gabriel Byrne is going to the Vatican, and it's this beautiful- While editing, I noticed a striking similarity of this rotunda meant to be somewhere in Vatican City and the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco, particularly the statues and the small ornamentation here and here, as well as the stone urns called finials outside the entrance. So while the filmmakers seem to have actually gone to Rome, they thought a replica Roman structure in another city was more historically accurate and took the extra time and money to film a 10 second establishing shot on the other side of the planet. What an embarrassing waste. Stigmata is about Gabriel Byrne, a priest and or scientist and or detective who investigates alleged miracles on behalf of the Catholic Church as he tries to figure out why Patricia Arquette, an extremely normal hairdresser in Pittsburgh with an inexplicably huge apartment, is experiencing signs of stigmata while the evil bureaucracy of the Catholic Church attempts to put the kibosh on their investigation. A boring mess that wants to be both a horror thriller inspired by real Catholic history and a slick 90s anti-piracy ad that will interest Gen Xers and convince them that religion is cool because it's gruesome and gory, but ultimately is devoid of any meaning or moral and is a toothless retelling of The Exorcist with more steps. The one big problem I had with, well, the one, I had many big problems with this movie, but like the one that stood out the most to me was the, especially in the beginning, because we're in Brazil and they're clearly there. Maybe not in Brazil, maybe like oh. Mexico or something. Yeah. But it's a real village yeah. in this other country. And then it's like, all right, now we're gonna cut to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. <laughs> and they, they don't tell you that it's Pittsburgh for like, uh, for like 45 minutes. I thought it was New York the whole time. Because there's a subway scene, it's bustling street scenes. No offense to Pittsburgh, but it was a random choice. One of the main problems with Stigmata, so long story short, I'll try to make this short, is there is a priest in, uh, who has- My head already fucking hurts, uh, dude. I'll get, I'll get it. There is a priest who uncovered a scroll that was supposedly written actually by Jesus who said basically, God is everywhere. And this would change, it would basically ruin the Catholic Church because it's it, it, in contrast with their dogma. He dies, he has a rosary. The rosary ends up in the hands of Patricia Arquette, who gets possessed by, by the spirit of this priest in order to get his message out to the world. But you would think if you're possessed by a good guy, it'd be like a good possession, yeah, yeah, yeah. but she's like turns evil. Yeah. And it doesn't make it, it, so it's like, what, why? And and they, they make a big deal about how to get like stigmata. And they say, if you get that, you have to be a very holy person. But Patricia Arquette is the most average of all people. They make a point way too late in the movie to point out that she is an atheist. Right. Are you are Catholic. No, I don't go to church because I don't believe in God. <laughs> So why why did it it, uh, it possess her? And liter the, the explanation in the movie is her mother is in Brazil and buys the priest's rosary from a street kid. She mails it to Patricia Arquette as a present and Patricia Arquette gets possessed. But like you pointed out, she's like the fourth person to touch it. Yeah. So why her? Why not the street kid? Why not the mom? Why not the postage handlers at the UPS? Maybe the priest really wanted to like go to Pittsburgh, but he never got the chance while he was alive. And he was like, oh, perfect. <laughs> he waited to possess somebody till they were in Pittsburgh. If you're gonna say in the last act that she is definitively possessed by this old priest because she touched his rosary, it, it, it ruins the entire rest of the beginning of the movie because we saw other people touch this. Like it, it's weird that it's presented as if like you, it's you. You can get possessed like like the common cold. You just like get too close there's to somebody. A, there's actually a real, fucking awesome Latin American movie that came out last year called Where Evil Lurks. That's the premise: is that demonic possession is like a plague. Again, yeah. they set that up. Yeah. We don't really get that until literally when she's in a bed 
and uh, the the uh, <laughs> I always think of him as the dad of Kira Knightley in Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> when he's strangling her in bed and then the whole room explodes and is engulfed in flames that is when we we really go, oh, so because she, she touched it? Yeah, the, the rules breaking or non-consistency is very frustrating. It's and, a uh, and th there's two other main things that happen. So she's getting this stigmata, which is like, okay, it's the priest trying to get the message out. She's writing words on the wall, right? You're, th that's like, on brand with this, but then the, at one point her eyes turn yellow. Well, she has two different ones yeah. yellow and one's like red. Yeah, Why? And, and there's like steam escaping, and she's basically looks like she's trying to kill Gabriel Byrne. And then 20 minutes later, when she's possessed, she's trying to seduce Gabriel Byrne, which really doesn't make sense in if the in the universe. Yeah, if it's this Thomas Aquinas inside of her. The Thomas Aquinas is the other priest from End of Days. Oh my God! I knew this was gonna happen. That the time period is very apparent. Like, yeah, I, can we talk about her fucking apartment? Insane. Giant. It's huge. It's like 2,000 square feet. In in one scene where something is happening in the background of her apartment, you can see a urinal. Also, a lot of blow up neon furniture. Her headboard is like an art deco train etching that looks like it. it it's like the art from uh, an Anne Rand novel. <laughs> and there's always leaks. There's just water dripping everywhere. Maybe that's why she can afford it. It's fucking falling apart. <laughs> how, how does she afford this? On a hairdresser salary? She, no, I- She also works at a salon slash piercing parlor slash tattoo parlor. Right. Yes. Where Portia de Rossi is one of her coworkers. Right. It's so 90s. And again, the juxtaposition, I was saying this earlier, the juxtaposition between like this sort of old world, uh, a, a, you know, religious aesthetic with like cobblestone streets and, and you know, just the way when you imagine like the Vatican or the Catholic church, there's a very specific aesthetic that comes to mind. It does not work when you jump between that, uh, like a, a set that looks like a, uh, a set from like the Godfather. Or it's like the Vatican library. Yeah. yeah. To, Uber, what did I write down? Like Uber or hyper modern 90s. It's like techno thriller. It's like Johnny Mnemonic, any of the Keanu Reeves yeah. movies, Strange Days, fucking, all of those. The rave just has random chain link fences. They're all wearing bright neon crop tops. They're, they have like stupid fucking, she looks like Gwen Stefani. Yeah. Everyone looks like Gwen Stefani yeah. in this fucking movie. And everything is hyper saturated hyper grainy. I saw a comment on Letterboxd that, yeah, described it as like one of those anti-piracy, like you wouldn't steal a car ads. That's what it you looks like. You wouldn't download oh, a car. That juxtaposition of the two very distinct and disparate design languages uh, just don't mesh, you know? And, and like, I can see like if you put Gabriel Burns priest character in a modern city, that works a little bit more. It, he's not out of place he, anywhere. He's sort of like a neo-noir character, which I like, I love detective movies. So that's, oh, yeah, yeah. that's, I mean, this, this, this movie definitely is like less on the special effects. It's more like a, Neo noir yeah. style, there, and we've got Chumba Wumba. There's a Chumba Wumba song. Whoa. There's a Massive Attack song. The score is by Billy Corgan. <laughs> like that's how '90s this movie is. In my synopsis, I I mention how it's like clearly being catered toward or geared toward young Gen Xers uh, by sensationalizing religion, especially the Catholic Church. 
you know? Because even within like that sort of techno ravey uh, subculture, there was a lot of like sort of religious iconography that was kind of co-opted, right? Like it, it, it comes across with like crosses and things like that. Uh, and, and it has a very similar introduction to End of Days where yeah. you've got scrolls, the sundown over the Vatican. Scrolls. There's writing in Aramaic or whatever. <laughs> it's kind of weird, it, not weirdly, there's nothing wrong with being pro-Jesus, but it's right. unexpectedly sort of pro, like pro-faith. Yeah. Which is not what you expect. Because the bad guys are the church. It's not even just the church, it's like bureaucracy. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the bad guy is the bureaucrat. It's <laughs> paperwork. <laughs> in terms of performance, she is the Arnold Schwarzenegger in this movie. It's not nearly as bad. It's not nearly but as bad, yeah. but like. She, she kind of has, uh, she's a little wooden and flat in some scenes, but then like the scene where everything's exploding and she's scrawling on the car hood. Oh, yeah. She's like way, way over the top. And it, it borders on camp. It like gets yeah. really fucking uh, close to like, oh, I'm just, this is a comedy now. <laughs> and I think part of that is because she has no backstory. Like at the beginning when her mom calls her, you're like, oh, is there some tension with her? No, no. the mom's just calling to say hi and tell her she's on vacation. She need to have a really good uh, relationship. And, and she's like going out late at night and is like, oh, does she have some like, no. Drama in her personal life. No, she's just a young woman who's working, who's having a great time. Like, no. well, good for you. That's great. But she's, it doesn't make a good movie character. She's kind of interested in Patrick Muldoon, <laughs> who every time I see his fucking face, all I can see is him getting his brain sucked out in Starship Troopers. <laughs> like, that seems to be the only sort of drama going yeah, on yeah, in her life. Yeah, she has, is, is he the one that stays overnight at the beginning? Yeah, and he's got the backwards Kangol hat. Uh, yeah, he like, and he leaves without saying goodbye. That's and, how we're introduced to her. And it's like, but it's not even a problem. They're like, they're doing fine. She's just like, oh, just say goodbye next time. Yeah. Like no drama. She's just kind of got are everything resolved under pretty control. Quickly. <laughs> and then she deals with this stuff. So it just feels very out of left field. Honestly, you, you feel bad for her. Yeah. Because we're set, her, her character introduction is like the, a very 90s music video sex scene <laughs> with like double exposures and shit. And there's like a, there's like a weird pregnancy scare thing that's, that's like kind of a red herring. Yeah, she asks the doctor after yeah. she gets her back all whipped up. She's like, was I pregnant? He's like, no. She's like, oh, okay. Did you run a pregnancy test? Um, yes. Am I pregnant? What, what, what's Why? happening? Why? Why? Like this isn't this, these, it, it really feels like the screenwriter or somebody thought like, oh, we'll just throw these things in there as character development, it but is. then they don't, there's no arc. There's no yeah. payoff. Yeah. You set this, th these things up and then they're resolved literally in the next scene. That's not how you do that. Which <laughs> is surprising because the, the directors who made this movie, wow, they are just, the guy who directed End of Watch is the director of the masterpiece with John claude Van Damme, Time Cop. And the Stigmata guy directed Blank Check. So it's really surprising coming from these esteemed filmmakers. Going from Blank Check to this. <laughs> Maybe was a little bit out of his element there. <laughs> I, it would make more sense if it was like, oh, because she's an atheist, she's being sort of punished in, in a way through this possession that, that makes her come around to be, being a believer at the end. None of that really happens. Why her being an atheist had anything to do with it, what the lesson or the moral was, there's, there's nothing there. Yeah, with both of these movies, the stakes are objectively very high, but you don't feel any of it. Yeah. As opposed to like Armageddon and, and End of Days, not End of Days, and uh, Deep, Impact. Deep Impact, which we watched last time, like you feel the weight of those movies, yeah. you know, and both of these this week, you just, you don't feel the weight there. They, right. they don't carry across the importance of like the, the plot material. Well, and yeah. I think again, this was like a, a, a failing of a lot of nineties movies in this kind of aesthetic or genre where they kind of ignore the score and the music. Whereas in Armageddon and Deep Impact, they both had really good scores yeah. done by professional composers that made you feel something. Now, I want to clarify that sometimes this can come across as a little too manipulative 
especially in like ro romantic movies where they like the, the music swells and like it's convincing you like, oh, you should feel something now. In Armageddon and Deep Impact, for all of its failures, at least the music and the score yeah. was really good. These movies, it, it literally feels like they forgot. I don't remember well, any of the music. They're using from hit radio singles. Yeah. The, they were using what was hip at the time. You can't to, do that. It was like riding the, the wave of what was popular at the time. It, it comes across as really corny and cringe. And I don't know and if it's that's- It doesn't hold up. It dates it. Yeah, it really dates it. Whereas having like an actual composer with like a, a, a full on orchestra, that's kind of timeless. Or just or just a score that can be more modern, more modern, like a, like a, like the way Johnny Greenwood or Trent Reznor are making yeah. scores now, which are very modern and contemporary, but they are, it's very musical. Yeah, they're good musicians. They're not like fucking Fred Durst from Limp Bizkit. Yeah. Like, Fred Durst doesn't know anything about writing a song or composing. Johnny Greenwood, Trent Reznor, they have an understanding of music composer. theory yeah. and, and they compose I mean, things. even with like the Fred Durst, the Olympus, it's just a song that was on the radio and the like music supervisor was they like, They just like oh, dragged the, and the, dropped it into the their The kids timeline. are gonna like this. Talk about somebody who does know how to act, playing, you know, the diametrically opposite types of characters probably, and selling them both. Probably oh. filmed these right after yeah. each other with like um, maybe a couple weeks in between yeah. is kind of a wild feat for an actor to jump between two, uh, you know, with they're in the same sort of, you know, again, genre, like religious sort of things, but to go from playing sexy, titty grabbing devil to, <laughs> to, you know, priest who's kind of losing his faith and is like a scientist that has more of an analytical mind. But is a humanist and wants to do the right thing. Yeah, like that's a, that's, Im that's really impressive. And, and he, again, I think he, he's the one that holds these movies yeah. together. He's very compelling to watch. I want to go back and watch every movie he's been in after yeah. seeing his, him, which is like a wild thing to say after seeing some really not great movies. But that's the mark of a really talented actor who can who can shine even in the midst of really bad source material, who can make, yeah. that, make something out of like a garbage character. We've got Gabriel Byrne and he's incredible. There is one very specific moment that is incredible on the behalf on, on Arnold's behalf. And I didn't realize that this line was from this movie. Cause I think I've heard it. I think it's been used as like a sound bite in like hardcore punk songs in like maybe like a Graf Orlock uh, uh, song where <laughs> he's having his confrontation with Gabriel Byrne and he's trying to one up him and he goes, I'm a fucking choir boy compared to you. <laughs> and I've heard that. And when it happened in the movie, I was like, that's where this is from. <laughs> Fuck yeah. You're a fucking choir boy compared to me. A choir boy. You're in touch with your anger. I really like that. That's honestly, that alone is reason enough, I think to watch End of Days, just to get to that scene. <laughs> Which movie do you think executed this premise of modern day Catholic possession movie. So let me be clear. I didn't really like either of them. I, I didn't I, either. Uh, and, and in both of them, I was having a hard time not tuning out about two thirds of the way through. And then I kind of tuned back in for the big finish. Getting up to like do chores and <laughs> shit. You're like, nah, nothing's happening in this scene. I, I might've made a cocktail or two at some <laughs> point. But I think I like Stigmata. I mean, I think this is where you and I just sort of differ in our general taste of movies. I think you lean harder towards big explosions and I lean more towards boring people talking, you know, or more introspective sure. things. But I, I, I do, I love, I love uh, detective movies and neo-noir kind of stuff. And I liked that pacing. Again, I didn't like either of them. They're both bad movies. So I, I, I cannot overstate how much this is comparing raw, uh, moldy peaches with moldy apples. <laughs> <laughs> I like Stigmata better because I, I just like the flow of it. And I think the shaky cam in Arnold 
were like ruined, yeah. ruined end of days for me. I, I, there was no overcoming that. Listen, I share the same <laughs> sentiment. This was really kind of hard. I think we're gonna need to pick some better movies for our next round. Well, and I don't wanna be too hard on these movies. I, I, with like the amount of shit a movie like Madam Web is getting lately, mm -hmm. There are still real people that make these movies and there is real effort and art and, and, and technical know-how that goes into making any movie. It's a fucking miracle yeah. any movie has ever been made. And and at the time, I remember when these came out, the previews were fun yeah. and like people, I was too young to see either of these in theaters, but like Stigmata and In A Days would have been fun to see in theaters. You in know, 1999. You go your, yeah, you go with your friends, you get yeah. the, you do the whole thing and it's a, it's a, it's entertainment. It's definitely no worse than a lot of like entertainment movies that are coming out. We now. we also yeah. have the uh, the benefit of hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. And at the time, these movies were probably fucking groundbreaking. But we've seen thirty years of movies now in the progression, so it's obviously going to be a little skewed. So again, I want to try and not be super super hard on these movies. <laughs> these were not good, but there are. Way, way worse, worse movies out there. And like a lot of movies, I we both like watching bad movies. Yeah, I so, think they're funny. But sometimes they're so bad you can't finish them. Uh, and and both of these, I was not, I, I was joking that I was like making a drink or whatever, but I wasn't like tearing out my eyeballs trying no, no, to finish no. them. Yeah. I, I mean, I was laughing out yeah, loud. Like yeah. that's the thing is that like, listen, there's a, there's a bit of schadenfreude in watching these movies, in watching somebody clearly put a lot of effort <laughs> and be so uh, confident that what they're making is gonna be fucking good. And then it just doesn't, doesn't work. work. <laughs> and, and that's what makes a good bad movie, mm -hmm. is right. the person, the people that are making it have to believe that they're making something good. And when they fail, that's what makes it funny and, and enjoyable And that's to watch. what's camp and there's an entertainment factor yes. in that. Yeah. If people are too aware, like any movie from uh, uh, The Asylum, like the Sharknado type movies, like mm -hmm. they know what they're doing, those aren't fun. These movies, as sort of bland and not good and technically eh as they are, they're still watchable. And they're and they're an, they're just kind of boring. And they're an escape from the grind of day-to-day -day life. Like I love watching heavy, heavy movies, but yes. but on a Tuesday, the week is far away from Friday, and I'm tired. I don't want to watch uh, a Russian, you know, the art whale. movie. <laughs> yeah. God. Uh, with all that being said. I, it was still pretty hard for me to pick which one I enjoyed more. And this is gonna become, I think as we do more of these, harder and harder. Although there are, like I was saying, there are movies where it's like, oh, that's a really good movie. And then this is a just clearly a fucking terrible it's movie. It's not fair. It's not fair. These ones were like really close yeah. to being on par. But I can't not, watch an Arnold movie and go, hell yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. Uh, <laughs> like as, as much as they were trying to do the Martin Riggs character introduction and failing because of how ham fisted and over the top it was, I was still like, fuck yeah. I mean, how else do you introduce <laughs> this guy? How else do you do this yeah. scene? And, and again, like his, the, the uh, you're a fucking choir boy line. Some of the explosions, uh, Stan Winston, uh, uh, who, who, there's somebody else that's in it that, that I really enjoyed. And it's just kind of silly and it's fun. And uh, uh, Gabriel Byrne, I think I prefer Gabriel Byrne being evil guy over him doing the detective thing. He's pretty, he's fun as the devil. He's he, a lot he, of fun. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, think and that's, devil, that sells it for me. Devil characters are fun. Also, yeah. watching him act his ass off in, in next to Arnold is like hilarious because it's like I don't know if Gabriel Byrne like did came from theater or Juilliard or whatever, but it's like clearly he's like got some stage acting chops, and to see him just fucking run circles around Arnold in that confrontation was uh, it made Arnold better. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I had a lot of fun. I also liked that the hero died at the end of End of Days as opposed to like have a happy ending. Like I thought that was cool for a movie from the 90s. Sort of a redemption arc. What is fun about this whole project we're doing? <laughs> this experiment? This, ex this, this cinematic experiment. And it's, it's cool in art generally with this, when you see this, where people can have, take such 
the, like basically the identical subject material and create totally divergent visions of, of creativity from that. And even if they work or they don't, but it's just, we're both creative people and we've done, you know, we have our own creative endeavors that we've done over the years. Uh, and it's so, you know, that's what's magical about creativity, even when it falls flat, is how people's imaginations create, you know, you're looking at the same piece of clay and then you make something totally different out of it. And that's that's cool. Well, and, and regardless of how bad or good it is, at the end of the day, it's subjective, right? Yeah. But it is, there is still value. There's yeah. still value there. If we're watching like a, a Neil Breen movie and it's one of the worst things you've ever seen in your life, but you're laughing at the complete nincompoopery of, of a Neil Breen movie, you're still getting something out of it. Like not everything that's bad is necessarily a waste of time or shouldn't have existed or been made because now there's a fucking crazy man like Neil Breen out there making insane movies in his backyard that we all get to, we can watch and buy and revel in the madness of that man's mind. I don't, I, I mean, I think that's... All right, bye. All right, bye. Bye. You're a fucking quiet boy compared to me. What does that have to do with me?